military and other Russian ministries. Publicly, Prigozhin and his fighters have criticized Russian generals and defense officials for their performance on the battlefield. Prigozhin is trying to advance his own interest in Ukraine, and Wagner is making military decisions based largely, largely, on what it, they will generate for Prigozhin in terms of positive publicity. We continue to assess that Wagner currently has approximately 50,000 personnel deployed to Ukraine, including 10,000 contractors and 40,000 convicts. Our information indicates the Russian Defense Ministry has reservations about Wagner's recruitment methods. Despite this, we assess that it is likely that Wagner will continue to recruit right out of Russian prisons. Due to recent events, we assess that it is likely there are mounting tensions between Russian officials and Mr. Prigozhin. I also want to uh, discuss a little bit North Korea's ongoing support for Russia's military operations against Ukraine by, by providing arms and ammunition to Wagner. In part, because of our sanctions and export controls, Russia is searching for arms from foreign countries, including through Wagner. In recent weeks, we have seen North Korea, sorry, we have seen North Korean officials falsely deny that they have provided arms to Wagner. As we have said publicly, North Korea delivered infantry rockets and missiles into Russia for use by Wagner toward the end of last year. So today, we are releasing some imagery of this initial delivery. This imagery shows that on November 18th, five Russian rail cars traveled from Russia to North Korea. On the next day, November 19th, North Korea loaded those rail cars, which, rail cars with shipping containers, and the train returned to Russia. Now, while we assess that the amount of material delivered to Wagner has not changed battlefield dynamics in Ukraine, we do expect that it will continue to receive North Korean weapon systems. We obviously condemn North Korea's actions, and we urge North Korea to cease these deliveries to Wagner immediately. And we are going further by taking action against Wagner itself. Last month, the Department of Commerce designated Wagner as a military end user, which means we expanded the entity listing of Wagner to ensure that it cannot access equipment anywhere in the world based on U.S. technology or production equipment. Today, we are announcing additional actions that we are taking to help Ukraine defend itself against Russian and Wagner forces. First, the Department of Treasury will be designating Wagner as a significant transnational criminal organization under Executive Order 13581 as amended. In coordination with this designation, we will also impose additional sanctions next week against Wagner and its support network across multiple continents. These actions recognize the transcontinental threat that Wagner poses, including through its ongoing pattern of serious criminal activity. With these actions, and there will be more to come, our message to any company that is considering providing support to Wagner is simply this. Wagner is a criminal organization that is continuing wide, I'm sorry, committing widespread atrocities and human rights abuses, and we will work relentlessly to identify, disrupt, expose, and target those who are assisting Wagner. Second, as we have stated previously, the arms transfers from the DPRK are in direct violation of United Nations Security Council resolutions. So today, we shared information on these violations with the Security Council's DPRK Sanctions Committee panel of experts. We will continue to raise these violations at the Security Council alongside our allies and partners. And third, of course, and I think you saw Secretary Austin and Chairman Milley and, and Ramstein uh, today uh, at the eighth iteration of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, we are continuing to provide Ukraine with the weapons and equipment that it needs to defend itself. So, and you saw today the significant new package of security assistance, which included five, more than 500 armored vehicles, including Bradleys, striker combat vehicles, mine-resistant ambush protected vehicles, otherwise known as MRAPs, and of Humvees, all in addition to the armored vehicles that we have already announced. Now, this package also contains critical additional air defense capabilities, including both more air defense systems and more surface-to-air missiles, as well as more ammunition for the artillery systems and the HIMARS, the advanced rocket systems, that the U.S. has already previously uh, provided uh, to Ukraine. Look, we've been clear, and the President has been consistent. We're going to continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes to defend itself to defend its sovereignty and to defend its territorial integrity. You saw those actions today, and everything we're doing as well with respect to uh, North Korea and Wagner also reinforces those efforts. Thank you.
Okay, let's take a couple of questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you explain what the practical effect is of this designation of a transnational criminal organization? It will open up additional uh, avenues for us to continue to uh, not only sanction Wagner and uh, put more squeeze on their uh, ability to do business around the world, but will assist others in doing the same. It will broaden the network of of, uh, of uh, nations and institutions that will be able to stop doing business with Wagner. And then can I just ask one other question on Ukraine? What is the level of frustration here at the White House over Germany's position on giving tanks to Ukraine, especially since Germany doesn't have to give their own tanks, they just have to allow another country to, to send tanks to Ukraine? We're, we're working uh, not only in lockstep with the Ukrainians, but with allies and partners all over the world. And, and, uh, and these are all decisions that each nation makes for itself, sovereign decisions. We aren't arm twisting, uh, and nobody's arm twisting us. We are working uh, 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 inside what what you could consider a coalition of the willing here to provide Ukraine with the defense and security assistance uh, that it needs. Um, G Germany, uh, obviously a strong NATO ally, but they have they have stepped up. They have provided a lot. Uh, of equipment, including some air defense and some armored vehicles of their own, uh, to uh, to Ukraine, and they have, as we have, evolved their support to Ukraine over time as the war has evolved and changed. And we are just in a different phase now in this war, and so we're all talking about what kinds of collective capabilities can be provided. Way in the back. Yes, John. Thanks. Uh, John, you've been asked this question many times. When you say you uh, will continue to support Ukraine as long as they want, what do you mean by that? As long as they need, what do you mean by that? What win winning looks like for you in, uh, in Ukraine? Well, as long as it takes means as, as long as it takes, and it means that I'm unable uh, to give you a date certain on the calendar uh, for you know when uh, you know when uh, that support won't be necessary anymore. It's necessary now. It's going to be necessary in coming weeks and months for certain. And we want to make sure that we're meet meeting the need as best we can uh, for Ukraine. And you had what does winning look like? President Zelensky gets, determined, gets to determine uh, what victory looks like. We're not dictating that to him either. Um, what we've said is we're going to continue to help them defend themselves, defend their sovereignty, win back their territory as they should, as they must, uh, and to defend their citizens and their infrastructure. What territory? Crimea is, do you want them to retake Crimea? Uh, Crimea is Ukraine, and decisions uh, about uh, parts of Ukraine that uh, Ukra Ukrainian armed forces uh, are going to fight over or fight in or, um, or strike, that's up to President Zelensky and his, uh, and his military leaders. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Karine and John. Um, I have a question about Brazil. President Lula said he's coming to the White House February 10th. So my first question is, can you confirm the date? I can confirm that we look forward to seeing President Lula early next month. And this week, President Biden said that uh, the institutional structures in Brazil are collapsing. Uh, is the White House concerned that the risks remain high in Brazil and democracy in Brazil is still a danger? The President said at the, at the time uh, of those uh, violent protests that uh, we have confidence in Brazil's democratic institutions and we certainly have confidence um, uh, in the way the President has been handling himself uh, throughout that time and, and afterward. And, uh, and again, we look forward to to welcoming him here at the White House and to having more and deeper discussions uh, about uh, improving and deepening the relationship between the United States and Brazil. And when it comes to investigations that are uh, taking place in Brazil right now, did the, the administration offer any kind of assistance to, assistance to Brazil, uh, it, either uh, cooperation from U.S. law enforcement or intel agencies? I think we made it clear at the time that we'd be happy to to uh, to uh, support in any way that uh, that we can. I'd leave it to Brazilian officials to talk about their investigation, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karine. Um, thanks, Karine. Thank you, Admiral. Um, first, on Wagner, <laughs> can you um, uh, 
Can you talk about what sanctions are on the table against North Korea, given the fact that you've already identified them as, as supporting Wagner? I don't have anything to report right now in terms of specific sanctions. That's why today we brought it up to uh, the panel of experts uh, on, the, on, the, on the UNSC Resolutions uh, Committee, um, and we'll see where that conversation goes. But we're certainly not going to rule out the possibility for additional sanctions if that's deemed fit inside the UN. Secondly, on the on the tanks, can you just help us understand how badly Ukraine needs these advanced battle tanks right now, or is it not time sensitive? No, it's absolutely. Uh, we recognize that it's a a need, uh, a relevant and uh, and critical need for the Ukrainians. Um, so, pardon me for repeating myself, but I, I think it's important to remember what kind of fighting we're. We're talking about here. It's 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 rough terrain and it's open ground. A lot of it in the Donbass. I've described it a bit like Kansas. A lot of farmland, um, and uh, and and uh, mostly towns and villages that are not that big, not major industrial cities. And so when you're fighting in an area like that, and we fully expect the Ukrainians fully expect that the fighting in the Donbass will continue here for weeks and months ahead. Um, uh, combined arms maneuver. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying that you want to be able to maneuver on the ground quickly, effectively, with enough firepower uh, against uh, adversary ground forces. Um, and so these vehicles, all of them, I know we're fixated on tanks and I get that, but it's not just tanks. I mean, the Bradley fighting vehicles, which are tr they're tracked vehicles, uh, they kind of look like a tank, but they're, but they're not. They don't have the same firepower as a tank. And these strikers, which are eight-wheeled vehicles, but also they're very nimble, they're very fast. Uh, and they can deliver infantry troops on an open battlefield with much greater speed uh, than if they didn't have those kinds of vehicles. And they are protected. They're armored. That's why, we, you know, we, we stress the armor capability here. Tanks also provide an ability to move uh, efficiently around a battlefield, but of course they have much more firepower. And so it's perfectly understandable why President Zelensky, facing what he's facing in the Donbass and expecting to face those same threats uh, going forward in coming weeks, uh, would want, uh, uh, you know, some tanks, additional tanks. It's not like he doesn't have any, but additional tanks uh, to support his offensive uh, and defensive operations in that particular part of the country. Given what you just said, you know, because the talks failed in Germany, does that change the U.S.'s position on sending the M1 Abrams at all? I don't know that I would describe talks as failing in well, Germany. Not progressing to the sense of, you know. I mean, if you're talking about the Ramstein meeting, I mean, my goodness, there was an awful lot of contributions coming out of today's contact group, and a lot. And a lot of it had to do with the kinds of capabilities, uh, armored included, uh, and artillery that the Ukrainians have been asking for for the fight that they're in. Um, uh, look, when it comes to the Abrams tank, um, uh, we, we've said we're going to continue to talk to the Ukrainians about their needs, and we're going to we're going to continue to meet them as best we can, um, and we'll do that. I don't have any decisions with respect to additional capabilities or systems like the Abrams to talk to today, uh, but we're in constant communication with the Ukrainians about that. The Abrams is a, a a powerful system. There's no doubt about it. It's also very expensive to operate, very expensive to fuel very expensive to maintain, and it requires a lot of uh, training. Um, uh, so there's a lot that goes in uh, to that when, when we are talking about what we're going to do to support Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Karine. Uh, John, I have two questions. First one on Wagner. What's your assessment on Wagner efficiency, success on the ground? Is, is Wagner better than the tradi traditional Russian forces? Well, Wagner would have you believe that. If you listen to Mr. Prigozhin and read his press releases, he would have you believe that he alone is achieving all the military victory uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. I will say this. They have, uh, they have been largely um, in, uh, responsible for and in command of efforts in Bakhmut, uh, in that town north of Bakhmut called Solidar, both mining towns. Go figure. And, um, uh, and that has caused, again, consternation with the Russian Defense Ministry. I will also say, and I've said this before, they have made incremental progress in both those areas. Now, we hold today that both towns are still contested. The Ukrainians haven't given them up. Uh, but the, 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 there's no doubt that the Russians have made some incremental progress there. But they have done it at an extraordinary cost. And I'm not talking about Russian soldiers. I'm talking about 
Wagner convicts. I mean, greater than 90% of the, of the thousands of casualties that Wagner, Wagner alone, forget the Russian army for a minute, have sustained, have been convicts, have been ex-prisoners that they've just plucked out of jails and, and put on, into the fight with little or no training, and no organizational capability whatsoever. So um, it has come at a cost. The last thing I'll say on this is, and I don't want to predict where it's going to go, but even if they are successful in Bakhmut or Solar, it's not going to strategically change the dynamics on the battlefield. It's not going to set the Ukrainians back to a degree where they're all of a sudden on their back foot and they're, and they're losing. Now, obviously, the Ukrainians don't want to give up either town, and who can blame them? They're Ukrainian towns. They should be fighting for them, and, we, and we're trying to help them do that. But I think we need to keep in perspective uh, the, what significance there, there may be, or in this case may not be, to either town falling. They are both mining towns, Gypsum in uh, Bakhmut and Salt up in Solodar, and we think that that also has a, a, a role to play in why Mr. Prigozhin is so adamant uh, on pouring, just literally throwing bodies into a meat grinder to get these two towns. It's very much in keeping with his uh, modus operandi in places like Africa, where he's going after you know mining rights and mining capabilities. Question on Haiti. Uh, any progress on the internationally respected forces on the ground? Any discussion further with Canada after the? Uh, we are. We're, we're still discussing with our uh, certainly with uh, our Canadian counterparts, and you saw the president, Prime Minister Trudeau, mm -hmm. uh, talk about this in Mexico City. Those conversations are continuing, not just with Canada, but but multilaterally with uh, other allies and partners uh, about the concern. Uh, sorry. Brazil too. I, I, I don't have a list of all the countries we're talking to, but it was clearly we're talking to other uh, allies and partners about um, uh, about the situation in Haiti. We're looking for additional ways to hold to account uh, the criminal organizations, the thugs, the gangs that are in, that, that continue to propagate violence uh, and instability there in uh, Haiti. But I don't have anything specific with a multinational force to, to speak to today. Those conversations are ongoing. We have to wrap it up. Go ahead, James, in the back of the Kareen, thank you. Admiral, thank you. I have two questions about the Middle East. The first uh, is focused on U.S.-Saudi relations. The decision on production levels by OPEC Plus that so incensed the administration uh, was announced on October 5. Uh, that prompted the administration to vow that there would be a recalibration of the U.S.-Saudi relationship and as a feature of that, that some kind of adverse consequences would be imposed on the Saudis. Um, we are now closing in on February. It seems to me that whatever consultations the administration uh, would have wanted to pursue internally and with members of Congress on the Hill uh, have had ample time to unfold at this point, uh, and no such um, consequences have been announced. Do you want the Saudis to understand that there will be no consequences? I beg to differ, James. Uh, I mean, you saw shortly after. Uh, that decision that uh, that Congress uh, even uh, put put more more restrictions on uh, arms sales to, to Saudi Arabia. So there's already been just in terms of arms sales um, an effect on uh, Saudi Arabia, and the discussions continue. Uh, we didn't say we were going to do some sort of homework assignment and get back to you in two weeks. We said we were going to continue to look at this relationship to make sure that it's best serving the American people and our national security interests, and the president's going to keep doing that. That said, and I've said this many times before, uh, Saudi Arabia is a strategic partner. It's an important relationship uh, for both our countries. Uh, and so we have, to, we have to be mindful of the, the shared uh, interest and uh, common security challenges that we both face. On Iran, can you attest that okay. since, on Iran, can you attest that since President Biden took office, Iran has not diminished its breakout time? I'm not going to talk about intelligence uh, matters that I am not allowed to talk about uh, uh, here at the podium with respect to uh, uh, specific breakout time for the, the Iranians. What I can tell you, James, is that uh, uh, we continue to believe that their breakout time is shortening um, because there's no deal in place. Um, and uh, we're, the president's been clear that we are not going to allow Iran to achieve a nuclear weapons capability. He's serious about that. So you're telling us that absent a, a renewed JCPOA, you have no options for keeping their breakout time where it was? That is not what I'm saying at all. I said the president said we're going to make sure that Iran cannot achieve a nuclear weapons capability. We're not focused on the Iran deal right now. Iran decided that the, they weren't going to take the negotiations seriously and instead decided to brutalize their own people and to support Russia's war in Ukraine. And so that's where our focus is. But we also have to make sure that we have all 
the capabilities and resources available to us in the region and beyond to defend our national security interests. That's what the president said. That's what we're focused on. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it has been said that it detained an American citizen um, uh, that they say was suspected of gathering biological intelligence. It's been a day now. Has the administration been able to make contact, been in touch, anything you can say about that? I don't have an update for you on that. Let me take the question and see if we can get you something. I don't have an update for you. Can I ask you one more Russia-related question? The Coast Guard yesterday off Hawaii said that they were, they were keeping track of a Russian sort of spy ship, intelligence gathering yeah. ship. At what point does that concern you? A point is that so unusual that we need to figure out exactly what they're doing? It's not unusual. Uh, I mean, it, obviously, we're, we're mindful of it, and we're going to continue to monitor. I think you saw uh, uh, our commanders out in the Pacific talk about that. We'll obviously monitor that, but um, it is not uh, completely atypical behavior uh, for the Russians. Uh, and you know, the fact that we see it, we talked about it, we know they're there. I think tells you that we obviously we take it seriously. Seriously, but not concerned. I didn't say that at all. I mean, of course, we take it seriously. I mean, uh, we understand that the Russians are going to try to collect intelligence through a variety of different means. That's not new. What I'm saying is, it's it's not a completely new phenomenon. It's not something we haven't seen before, and we know how to we know how to treat it. We know how to deal with it. Jeff, last question. Thanks very much. Uh, two questions, John. First, on the North Korea aspect, how do you judge where they're getting money to help Russia if it's a country that reports show is having trouble? Yeah, um, not every country that should uh, observes the sanctions regime. So they are still able to trade uh, with countries like Russia and with uh, China. Um, and um, obviously that's a whole different set of problems, but they are able to, uh, to skirt sanctions to continue to, to, uh, to funnel money into their economy. Um, but let's keep it in perspective. Yeah, this is not a burgeoning economy. This is not a country that is um, that is wealthy by any stretch or uh, is um, um, necessarily viable and flexible uh, on, in the in the global economy. And one follow up on uh, Darlene and Regis questioning: What what does Germany, from your perspective, need to hear now, either from the United States or from the rest of the NATO allies, before giving a green light? To those leopard tanks. I don't think they need to hear anything uh, specific from the United States other than what we've been saying, Jeff, which is that these are sovereign decisions. We respect them. We we welcome them. We we do believe that there is a need for uh, armored capability, including tanks inside Ukraine. Uh, and the leopard tank is a terrific system, very very uh, modern, uh, very effective. Um, and so I, I think we've been nothing but clear privately and publicly with, with Germany and all our allies and partners, that if, if you can meet a, a need that the Ukrainians have, uh, then you know we obviously want to see you do that. And again, I point you back to today in Ramstein. I mean, so many nations showed up to, to, to contribute and to offer additional capabilities, including you know in the armored space uh, to Ukraine. So I mean, I, I, I think, again, we've been very consistent on, on this. Guys, we don't have a lot of time, so thank you so much, John. Have, have a good weekend. All right, happy two-year anniversary to us. Uh, <laughs> I know. Anyway, all right, today marks two years since Pre President Biden and Vice President Harris were uh, sworn in to office, as you all know. In the past two years, we have seen significant economic growth, and President Biden built the most historic legislative uh, record since the Johnson administration. In fact, over the last 24 months, nearly 11 million jobs have been created, including 750,000 manufacturing jobs. The unemployment rate is near a 50-year low. Nearly 10.5 million Americans have applied to start a new small business. Inflation is now at its lowest since, since October of 2021. We funded 7,900 projects through the bipartisan infrastructure law, reaching over 4,000 communities all across the country. And um, private companies have announced nearly $300 billion in investments across the United States. 
The president will mark today's anniversary with nearly 200 bipartisan mayors from across the country, which will be happening very, very soon. And you will hear more from both the president and some of our na nation's mayors who are here today after the briefing. Uh, really quickly, I have one thing that I want to share with all of you, which is the week ahead. It is Friday. Today, the president will be traveling to Rehoboth, Delaware. He will return to Washington, D.C. on Monday. On Tuesday, the president will host Democratic congressional leaders at the White House. In the evening, the president will also host a White House reception for new members of Congress. On Thursday, the president will deliver remarks on our economic progress since taking office. That evening, the White House will host a Lunar New Year reception in the East Room. And of course, per usual, we will have more to share as the days go by. Okay, Darlene, welcome. I haven't seen, I feel like I haven't seen you in a long time. Okay, good. Okay. I always say that to Josh and he's like, no, that's not true. <laughs> I have a question about the chart, but it disappeared. Okay, um, we can, maybe, we can, maybe it'll magically appear. <laughs> Until it reappears, um, can you talk a little bit about what, what message the White House is trying to send on Sunday by having the Vice President uh, deliver a speech on abortion rights in the state of Florida, and specifically in the state capital of Tallahassee? So as you know, the Florida is, a, is an important state as we're talking about fighting for women's health care uh, for a few reasons, and let me just run through them. Florida has an abortion ban, which is, uh, which is on the books, so that's number one. In the th it is the third largest uh, state in the country, as you all know, and is surrounded by several states, several states around uh, its border with even more restrictive abortion laws and those, uh, b excuse me, bans which are in place as well. And because Florida's ban is less stringent than in the neighboring states, the state has increasingly become a place where women can go to, uh, to access uh, care there. Uh, yet right now the state is considering an even more extreme ban on the books, which would be devastating not just for uh, Florida women, but if you think about, again, the southern region, if you think about the states uh, that Florida borders. And so it is important in this moment that we are currently in. And also uh, it was the first state that the vice president visit, visited after the devastating situation uh, that, we, that we received uh, just, uh, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, and so Again, you know, this is uh, this is something that uh, after the Dobbs decision, so it's, we felt she felt uh, it would be a good state uh, for the 50th anniversary, which would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. And on the chart, there are two headings there that say record health care enrollment. One says 11 million, nearly 11 million. The other says nearly 15.9. What's the difference? That's a good question. I would have to ask our team. <laughs> I'm going to be very, very honest with you. On that, uh, let me get back to the team, and then we'll be able to decipher the difference. Really quick question. The president going to his home in Rehoboth Beach today, does that have anything to do with classified documents being found at Wilmington and none being, being found at Rehoboth? So as, as it relates to classified documents, information, which the president takes very, very seriously, and you heard him speak to it uh, when he was asked by your colleagues yesterday when he was traveling in California, I would refer you to the White House Counsel Office uh, for any statement coming from here or, or, or um, uh, anything new developments coming from here, uh, but uh, as, and as it relates specifically uh, to the investigation, I would refer you to Department of Justice, so I'm not going to, uh, not going to comment uh, on that piece at all from here. I'm just going to continue to be prudent mm -hmm. uh, and consistent and respect the Department of Justice uh, process. As it relates to his travel, as you know, he often travels uh, to, to Delaware on the weekends. I, don't, I just don't have anything else uh, to share, but anything related to uh, the um, legal process, I would refer you to the White House Counsel. Uh, I'm going to try and go around here. Uh, Joey, I haven't gone through that. Yeah, thank you. What was the White House's reaction to Governor Ron Santos's education department blocking the teaching of AP African American Studies, uh, saying it violates Florida's new uh, state law and, quote, significantly lacks educational value? Does uh, the White House have concerns about this action by the DeSantis administration? So first, I want to be very clear, the administration does not dictate uh, any curriculum for local schools. That is not something uh, that we do here. But there is something that we do want to comment. It is, um, it is in, in, incomprehensible 
that uh, to see that uh, this is what uh, this ban or this block, to be more specific, uh, that DeSantis has put forward. If you think about the study of black Americans, that is what he wants to block. Uh, and, and, and again, these types of actions aren't new. They are not new from, from what we're seeing, especially from Florida, sadly. Florida currently bans teachers uh, from, take, from talking about who they are and who they love as we've talked about many times here in this briefing room. They have banned more books in schools and libraries than almost every other state uh, in the country. And let's not forget, they didn't ban, uh, they didn't block, be more clear, I want to make sure I'm using the right word here, they didn't block AP European history, they didn't block our, our music history, they didn't block our uh, art history, uh, the, but the state chooses to, to block a course that is meant for high achieving high school students to learn about their history of arts and culture. And uh, it is, um, you know, it is uh, incomprehensible again. Uh, and I will just uh, leave it there. Leave it there to make your own, uh, to make your own determination of why this occurred and why this happened. Again, it is not our place uh, to to direct or to to uh, be involved in any local school curriculum. Uh, but this is concerning. Thanks, Green. Um, you mentioned lawmakers will be back in town next week. There's a new-ish speaker of the House. Does the President have any desire to have him to the White House to meet face-to-face? -face? So I know there's been reporting on this. I don't have a date to confirm uh, from here about a potential meeting with uh, uh, speak, uh, Speaker, the, new, the newly minted, as you just uh, trying to say, uh, Speaker McCarthy. The President has, as I just mentioned at the top, as you just said, Phil, a series of meeting with, uh, he's going to have a series of meeting with leadership uh, in Congress to talk about in a, in a, a a, you know, a range of issues that matter to the American people. Uh, again, don't have anything to confirm here. And one of the things that the president is looking forward to do is talking about issues that matter to the American people, as I just stated, but also uh, to, to, to continue to develop and grow uh, their relationship, their working relationship to, together. I don't have, uh, again, I don't have a, a specific date uh, to announce from here. Just for clarity's sake, if when a meeting happens with the speaker, if the speaker brings up the debt limit, would the president reiterate the position that you guys have been firm on? Well, I, I'll say this. Look, it's a range of issues, and I just said the president has been very clear about where we stand uh, on uh, the position of default. Ve really very clear. I've said it. The president has said it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is something that has been repeated when you think about dealing with the debt limit, when you think about what, the, what Congress has been uh, able to do the last three times with the last uh, administration. And it's, it's it's a responsibility that they have. It is a basic responsibility that Congress has to deal with the debt ceiling. And so we have been clear on this. The President has been clear on this. It should not be used as a political uh, weapon, political, we should not be putting it in a hostage uh, situation. We should be dealing with this uh, in a way that is responsible. We think we're talking about the American people. We're talking about jobs. And more broadly, this is a President that has, I just went, talked through uh, the first two years of this presidency and what he has been able to do with the, with the economy, building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, and the president wants to continue to de to continue to uh, to continue to build on our successes, and that's what Republicans in the Congress should want to do: continue to build on that, work with us, not take us back. And so that's going to be the focus of this president, as he has been focused on this past two years. Okay. Well, if the poll needs to, to go, I'll continue. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, isn't it customary to have a meeting with the Speaker and the first Speaker of the Congress returning? Is this, in effect, a snub of Speaker McCarthy? And how should we take this? No, look, the President is looking forward to meeting with Speaker McCarthy. We are. I just don't have a date to share with all of you at this time. Uh, but he is looking forward to meeting with Speaker McCarthy uh, and, uh, and to... There's a meeting about the debt limit specifically. Well, no, I mean, look, it's going to be about a range of issues, right? And when the president speaks to members, when he has meetings with members, he talks about a range of issues. I don't want to get ahead of a meeting that has not been locked in. It's a little bit of a hypothetical here. Uh, but again, when the president uh, normally talks to congressional members, when he has meetings with them, there are a range of issues that are talked about. But we have been very, very clear from here about where we stand uh, when it comes to the debt ceiling. I have been clear. The president has been clear. It should not be use as a political football. Uh, but again, he's looking forward to meeting with the speaker and continue to uh, to build on that relationship. Does the President have a view on whether it should be suspended or whether it should be increased? 
we, under Trump we, three times was suspended and it's not that is, look, we think that Congress should deal with this in a bipartisan fashion, as they have about 78 times in the past. Uh, this is something that Congress has done. It is their it is their basic responsibility as a congressional member, and that's what we want to see. Anything else about the specifics, that's up to Congress. But this is something that needs to be dealt with. We're talking about jobs, right? We're talking about seniors. You know, we're talking about veterans. Right? We're talking about real-life potential uh, uh, issues that could affect Americans across the country. So it should not be used in a way to put to hold the debt ceiling in in hostage, right, uh, because they want to cut Social Security, right, because Republicans, MAGA Republicans in the House want to cut Social Security or they want to cut uh, Medicare. That's, that should not be where we are right now. We should not be uh, moving forward in conversations about the debt ceiling in that way. They should be dealing with it. Yeah. What does the president mean when he said no regrets? Because he's also said he takes very seriously the handling of uh, classified documents. So I'm unclear what he means about no regret. So I'm not going to uh, comment further from what the president has said uh, yesterday. I think he uh, he laid out his thoughts. He was asked about it. He laid out his thoughts of whatever question he was asked. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into specifics or I'm not going to uh, go beyond what the president has said. But I will reiterate from here. Uh, that uh, and basically what he said to 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 all of you many times at this point that he does indeed take classified information and seriously he does indeed take classified documents seriously I'm just not going to go beyond that I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office for any specifics on on um, on on the president's comments or what how the process is moving forward. Can you just shed light on um, was he referring to sort of the rollout of the information or about the timeline or. I'm just unclear about what he's and, not regretting. And, and, and Kelly O, I totally understand the question. I totally understand why you may want clarity here, but I'm going to be prudent. I'm going to be consistent here. I'm not going to comment on um, on on the ongoing uh, process, the legal process from here. Uh, I will just let the president's words stand for itself. I'm going to go around here. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Wait a minute. Thanks. Um, Quickly, um, do you have any update on the president getting a physical? He hasn't had one in a year. I don't know if you guys, if he intends to get one. Yeah, we. Uh, I've spoken to this a couple of times. He will have one before the, by the time the end of this month uh, is out. Uh, and so we will do the same that we did the last time. And back in uh, 2021, we were, where we uh, provide uh, with full transparency, his, his medical uh, um, physical. And so, again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to be transparent. He, we will share the information. Uh, we will have more to share uh, about that before the, the month is over. And then I also wanted to ask, um, without speaking about the investigation or the special counsel specifically, if you could walk us through a little bit of how, what the process in general is supposed to be when classified documents are improperly found. And if the White House has any role in those circumstances if, the, if they refer anything to the Office of Director of National Intelligence or, or sort of what that process should be. Um, again, sort of not necessarily referencing the current you. situation, but Matt, just in general. I, I hear the question. It's been asked to me many different ways, many different I'm, times. I'm trying yet another <laughs> And I appreciate the effort. Uh, again, I am going to refer you on the particulars of the process and how it goes down and how it works. I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel uh, Office. My colleagues there, they will be happy to engage with you and listen to your question and answer it the best that they can. I am just not going to be speaking it from here. From here and my colleagues who have already been engage engaging with many of, of your colleagues and probably you over the last two weeks, I'll let them, t I'll let them take care of that. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Karine. Um, could you just speak a little bit more about why why is it uh, Vice President Harris is going to be giving the speech, uh, in particular her, uh, on Sunday, and does the President have a message for the people at the right, um, the March for Life march? So, so as you know, the March for Life um, march happens every year, yeah. and uh, so we support peaceful, free, uh, uh, even uh, when we disagree with it, clearly it is not, uh, there, it is, it is not an issue in their point of view, we do not agree with. Uh, look, because the President believes that it is, it is critical, uh, the, is the, it is a critical pillar of democracy to do that in a peaceful way, to march, uh, and so of course we support that. Uh, but that said, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we continue to underscore uh, the ongoing 
ongoing attacks on women's rights to make their health, their own health care decision. This is something that the Biden, Biden-Harris Biden administration has taken very seriously. Uh, this is something that you have heard us take action, executive action on. And this is something that, an issue that we're going to continue to ask Congress uh, to make sure that they take actions on this as well. As we go into the next couple of days, uh, into the what would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Uh, so this is an important issue, a critical issue. Let's not forget, uh, in the during the midterms, voters made themselves very clear. They want us to make sure here in Congress and at the White House and the federal government that we protect uh, our people's rights. Yeah, and they want to see that. Uh, and so uh, that is how we see the March uh, March for Life. Again, we support peaceful. Uh, peaceful uh, uh, speech, free of speech, peaceful march, uh, even though we don't agree uh, with their with their particular policy or issue. The Vice President, why is, she, why, why is she doing the speech? Yeah. Give me one second. If yeah. anybody wants to go and cover the President, you're free to do so. You do not feel, if you're confirmed. <laughs> That's right. No. <laughs> yeah, I know if there's like, if folks are have been registered and confirmed to go, please please feel free. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just the Vice President, she's giving the speech. Uh, yeah, so look, you've seen the Vice President be a leader on, on this issue over the last several months since the Dobbs decision uh, came down this past summer. It is not unusual. I had just mentioned that after the, the it was the, Florida was the first state that she visited after the Dobbs decision, and so uh, she's going back. And, and the importance of Florida, right? The importance of where it is, sent, where it is located and the border states around it, and why we think it's important, uh, sh and she thinks clearly is important to go uh, make that speech in Tallahassee uh, on Sunday. Uh, but again, the vice president has been a leader on this, so it has the president. You've heard of her from both of them multiple times. You've seen her bring roundtables together to really try to figure out how to deal with this critical issue of protecting a woman's right uh, to make her own decision about her health care. And so you'll continue to see that uh, from uh, from this White House for sure. Okay, I'm going up ahead. Thanks, uh, Reid. Um, yesterday, uh, the former president, uh, President Trump, uh, called for the jailing of uh, a pair of reporters from Politico who published that uh, lead Supreme Court opinion last year, as well as uh, the editor who supervised them and the publisher uh, of Politico. And, I know there was a uh, White House statement that went out earlier today, but I, I was hoping you could weigh in a little further on uh, how the president feels about that sort of talk and uh, his commitment to press freedom. I can tell you that uh, the president believes the freedom of press is part of the bedrock of our American democracy. That is something that he truly believes uh, and that we should be, you know, continue to fight for. And calling for egregious abuses of power in order to suppress the constitutional rights of reporters is an insult. It is a complete insult to the rule of law and undermines fundamental American uh, values and traditions. So instead, it's the instead it's the responsibility. It's the responsibility of all leaders uh, to protect First Amendment rights, and that's what the president believes, and that's what he's going to continue to do to make sure that we protect those rights. Uh, particularly with print publications, uh, can you commit uh, to making him more available for uh, for one-on-ones with both print and uh, other outlets uh, what, this year? Here's what I can tell you. The president is going to engage with reporters almost on a daily basis. He did it yesterday. He took questions uh, from your colleagues yesterday uh, when he was in California, and he will continue to do that. Uh, and uh, he believes that's important. He believes it's an opportunity to, when he communicates with all of you or answers your question, he, he believes it's an important uh, kind of, you're an important vessel to the American people, right? Pushing out uh, what he is doing on, on behalf of the American people. He's, he does that almost every day. Almost every day when he's in front of all of you, he takes a question. That's the commitment uh, that I can make uh, from here, uh, from the president. I'm going to move around. Christina? Thank you for taking my question, Tony. Um, you were just mentioning a possibility of executive actions on behalf of the American people. I was just wondering if the administration is considering any help or relief for thousands of immigrants that were paroled into this country before the agreement of the 30000 a month. They're, they're here. They don't have um, jobs. They're depending on different communities, charity work, and and uh, some of them have told us that they don't have court dates for another two years. 
So a, a couple of things. Um, I'm not sure what executive action. I think I was talking about. I may have been talking about something else. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. Not talking about unilateral. Right. You're action. talking about. So look, uh, the parole program that the President Biden uh, announced is because um, uh, I know that's usually how this question is connected to is limited to individuals who are seeking to enter uh, the United States in a legal, uh, orderly manner. The folks who got here before the program was announced. Uh, remain in immigration enforcement procedures uh, procedures under Title VIII. If an immigration judge determines they have a legal basis to stay in the country, they can. Uh, if they don't, they will be subjected to removal as required by law. Of course, since day one, the President has taken this issue very seriously. That's why he put forth uh, a comprehensive immigration reform. And, uh, and to fix the system that we currently have. And so that's why he continues to ask. Uh, he continues to ask Congress to take action. He continues to uh, talk to and, and ask uh, Republicans, instead of doing political stunts, like we have seen them do over and over again, to actually come to the table and deal with this issue. Uh, this is a president who has done more on, on this issue than any other president. When you think about the record funding that he's been able to put forth, and also trying to figure out multiple ways uh, to deal with uh, immigration, to deal with uh, people to, who, who want to come in and come through a legal process. He's offered many avenues to do that. And so, look, he's, he has used the tools that are in front of him to deal with uh, immigration, to deal with border security. But again, he needs Congress, uh, especially Republicans in Congress, to stop doing political stunts and to come to the table and actually deal with an issue that matters to the American people in a real concrete way, not in a way that we're doing political stunts and put, putting people's lives uh, at risk. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, on the topic of executive authority, the President's proclamation today marking what would have been the anniversary of Roe Wade said that he would continue to use executive authority to protect women's rights. What other actions are on the table? And if there are other possible actions on the table, why hasn't he taken them yet? So look, we're going to take a look of, of the tools that the President has uh, in front of him to take to see if there's any other executive actions clearly that he can take. But he took some. Right after uh, the Dobbs decision came down, he took uh, a couple of uh, executive actions and he took them right away uh, in, in cons consultation with organizations uh, who, uh, who really are fighting every day for women's, uh, women's rights. But again, the way that we are going to um, really deal with uh, what we're seeing currently Currently, with the with um, uh, with Roe v. Wade and making sure that it's uh, it becomes law is for Congress to act, and that's what you're going to continue to hear uh, from this president. That's what you're going to continue to hear from the vice president, uh, and uh, he's going to uh, certainly and she will too use his use their platform to make that very clear uh, to the American people. You guys feel like you've exhausted your options. I, you know, I'll just say this. I mean, the proclamation pretty much laid it out very clearly. We're going to see what else we can do, uh, but again. It's going to take congressional action to truly deal uh, with this issue. Okay. Go ahead. Does the president have any concern about the number of job cuts that are happening in the tech sector? Alphabet announced its Google's parent company obviously announced 12,000 job cuts today. Follows Microsoft earlier this week, um, following several thousand from last year as well. Is this something the president is concerned about? So of course well? we watch very closely when we hear these types of uh, reports uh, of Americans losing jobs. That is something that the president uh, is certainly aware of and, and, and watching and, and clearly his team. Uh, but you know there are data that shows and I mentioned this the other day that companies are still continuing to grow. That is important and they're investing in the United States. So those data points uh, exist. We're seeing that. Layoffs remain record low uh, according to job opening data, the U.S. economy continues to grow, initial unemployment claims are historically low, and the unemployment rate is a 50-year low. So leading analysts have publicly stated uh, that they do not believe the recent layoffs in the tech industry are indicative of trends uh, in the border economy. But of course, of course, when we hear that Americans are losing jobs, we, t we uh, certainly watch that very closely. Uh, one clarification, if I can, on, on the President's answer yesterday to the documents. He said in that answer that he is doing everything that attorneys are, are asking him to do, so this protocol and everything. 
was his answer vetted through through counsel or anything like that? Can you tell us that? I mean, it's the same thing that he has said before, which is his, he and his team are uh, cooperating fully. That's that's the same. So that's the same. That's the same answer he has given many many times, and so has his White, White House Counsel's office. Is that his and his team talking about it in the way that he did? He, that was I, I, again. He is he. That's nothing new. He has said that before. Uh, but again, I'm not going to uh, get into parse uh, the words of the president. It is you heard him say what he uh, gave his remarks and make his statement. I'm just not going to dive into that. And then on the meeting on Tuesday with uh, Democratic members, did, can you sort of characterize what that meeting is? Is it sort of a temperature taking? Is agendas and, and priorities are set for the upcoming State of the Union speech? Well, look, I mean, uh, it, it is part of the new Congress, right? New leadership with the new Congress is an opportunity clearly ahead of the State of the Union to uh, connect and continue to grow the relationships that he has with leadership. And they're going to talk about a range of issues. It is not uncommon. I think somebody just pointed that to me. I think uh, it was Josh who said, you know, how, how common it is to uh, for the president to meet with leadership at this time. So again, we're, uh, we're, we're doing uh, what the president believes is important as he tries to deliver for the American people, to try and do that bipartisanship that he talked about right after the midterms. Because because that, we understand that's what the American people want to see. Uh, and so that's what you're going to see next week with, with the president. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Thanks. Um, back on what you uh, said in your answer to Josh about the debt ceiling and the question of entitlement. Um, the nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget said in the fall that what, what the president was arguing in the lead up to the midterms was that Republicans would cut Social Security, cut Medicare, but the president was not offering his own specific plan for how to ensure the stability of those programs. Um, there were a few sentences on the, on the campaign website three years ago. Does the president have a plan to ensure that Social Security and Medicare will remain solvent in the future? This is now the halfway point of this administration. The president's plan is that he's going to protect Social Security. He's going to protect Medicare. And what he is saying very, very clearly here, and we have said this, you heard us, as you mentioned, you heard us say it during the fall, is that, uh, you know, we're going to continue to call out Republicans who are threatening. They are threatening to force cuts on Social Security, on Medicare, uh, and critical programs uh, that benefits everyday Americans uh, because they want to play this political gamesmanship. And that is something that we are going to call out. When it, when, as it relates uh, to uh, the debt ceiling, this is something that should be done in a bipartisan way. That's what the President believes. That's what he has been saying very, very clearly. We should not put on the chopping blocks, the very the very programs that matter to American people. Let's not forget, they've already paid in to those programs. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. This is something that Americans have paid into, and Republicans want to cut that. So I guess uh, my question, though, is, you know, what they say is that uh, Medicare in three to five years will not be able to meet all of its obligations. Social Security, 12 years, will not be able to meet all of its obligations. The president's been president for two years. He hopes to be president for six more years. When is he going to lay out a specific plan? Will we hear it at the State of the Union? Will it come in 2023? It's what we're saying is, and I just said this, these are programs that the American people pay into. These are programs that are veterans, that are seniors, right? Americans across the country really value and need. And when you have a you know, these MAGA Republicans in the House who are saying they're going to hold the debt ceiling unless those things are cut, that is, that is a problem. That is not how this works. I mentioned 78 times that, this, that the debt ceiling has been dealt with, three times, three times in the last administration. So we should not be doing this with conditions. It should be done without conditions, and we should not be negotiating around it. And let me just give you a couple of validators, because I think it's important. This came from Leader McConnell, who said, America must never default on its debt. It's never has and never will. Neil Bradley, who I think I talked about uh, a little bit from Chamber of Commerce a couple days ago, you're, you're talking about wiping out the very underpinnings of the U.S. economy. I mean, that is what they're trying to do. They're trying to hold programs that are critical and important, again, to our veterans, to our seniors, because they're trying to play political games. And that is the thing that the president's going to continue to call out against. Okay, we should. Thanks, Oh, he is? I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, the president's about to speak. I can't step on the president. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.
with your performance last week. Can you see feed for the job of Happy Friday. Happy Friday, guys. So we can't hear you. No, I just Especially when the did call it a state. Is that word? Yeah. Come back, come back, Nadia. All of you, come back. All of you. Yeah.